Hi everyone, my name is Will Klein, and I'm here today to talk about scaling best practices with syntax trees. Now you may have noticed on the sign outside that it actually says toolmaking with syntax trees, and I renamed the talk a couple times actually. And I realized that uh, while toolmaking is very important, and I think we all should all do more of it, uh, this talk is really about best practices. It's really about how we share knowledge across our teams and across our company. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. Four years ago, I had worked at a lot of smaller companies where there was maybe one or two developers on the team. And I was like, I was thinking I should work on a larger team. I should work in a larger engineering organization, learn some mature development practices, work on a bigger project. So I, I took an interview. I had, a, I had a recruiting company helping me out. And they were like, hey, um, you've been looking for, um, I was looking for C-chart jobs at the time. And they were like, hey, here's, here's another job. And it's a little bit different. It's with JavaScript. And uh, you should check it out. I'm like, uh, okay, sure. I, I didn't know that much. I didn't know that there was as much interesting stuff going on in the front end world that day, at the time. But I, I gave it a shot. So I took the interview and I looked at the job description. It said five years expertise uh, you know, in JavaScript. I'm like, well, I don't really have that. I don't really know JavaScript that well. I've been using jQuery, but um, I'll give it a shot anyway. I took the interview and it was, it was at an insurance company. And when I was in college, I had sworn off working at an insurance company. So I'm from, I'm from Connecticut. And in Connecticut, there's a lot of insurance companies. And I thought, when I'm in college, well, I, I want to work somewhere interesting. I want to work on, like, video games or something, something really cool. I don't want to work on insurance. What's, what's interesting about that? Well, I took the interview anyway. And even though I didn't really know JavaScript, even though it was an insurance company, and uh, I, t I talked to them, and they asked me a bunch of technical questions about JavaScript. And I think I got almost every single one of them wrong. And I, I'm like, yeah, I, I really don't know that very well, do I? Um, but I asked questions. And there was a developer, on, um, there, was a developer there, and he, he, he gave me the answers. And he was telling me about how closures work and how scoping works in JavaScript. And he was telling me about some of the things they were doing, how they were building a single page app. And this was before the heyday of all the JavaScript frameworks that we have now. They had wrote their own. And I'm like, wow, that sounds really cool. I want to work here. And for whatever reason, they offered me the job. <laughs> so I, was, I, was, I jumped in there, and uh, I sat down, and I uh, looked, looked around myself. There was about 25 developers uh, working on the code base at the time. And I looked at the code base, and I started navigating through it. And I'm like, wow, this is crazy. <laughs> There's like this whole framework to it. There's all these business rules that they run. And it's just blowing my mind. And I knew I could figure it out, but I was, here I was trying to figure out JavaScript, trying to figure out how they used it, trying to figure out their framework, trying to figure out their application. And I'm just overwhelmed. <laughs> and I'm just sitting there scared. And uh, a developer came over to me, one of the senior developers, and he said, hey, well, relax. It's going to take you a bit. It's going to take maybe about six months to get up to speed. I'm like, oh, six months. That's a lot of time. I can do that. Uh, and I, I thought he was maybe kidding, you know, how, how does it take six months to get up to speed to become comfortable in the application? How does it take six months to, to understand what's going on and become effective as a developer? And uh, six months later, it, it indeed took about as long. I think I was committing code within two weeks, but to really understand the code base, to really have confidence in it, to really understand how we were applying the language, how the framework worked, how to write features in our application, it took about six months. So from there, I thought, this is awesome. I love my team. I love my project. But um, my wife and I, we grew up in Connecticut. We'd always lived in Connecticut. And I thought, well, let's, let's do something else. We'd always talked about seeing another part of the world. We'd always talked about getting out of Connecticut and doing something else. And here we were, thinking about starting a family. It's like now or never. <laughs> Either we do it now or we're going to be here forever. And so we, um, this was two years ago now, we uh, decided to move. And uh, we, we settled on Colorado. And it seemed to really suit us as people in our lifestyle. So we gave it a shot. We drove out. I actually drove out twice. I drove out with a, a car and uh, had to find a place to live. Lived on Airbnb for a little bit and then 
and then found us a place and went back and got the moving truck. And we came out here, did the whole trek. It was, it was an amazing experience. And I started at a company that I actually met at a conference. I started at Rally Software. And uh, I joined this team, and it, it, was, it was very similar in that it was, it was again working in front end. They again had uh, a framework. This was something they licensed from a, a third party. But man, it was just that much more complicated from what I'd seen before. And I sat down and looked at everything. I'm like, wow, there's, there's more code here. There's, there's, a there's a couple legacy frameworks we're working with here. There's a lot to learn. And my manager said, don't worry, Will. It's going to take you about six months. I'm like, wow, I'm, I'm noticing a pattern here. It takes me six months anywhere I go. And this is regardless of your experience level. This is regardless of how well you know the language and maybe how well you even know the framework or library that they're using. Like six months. So let's fast forward to today. And now, I've been on the com with the company for two years, uh, and we actually had the opportunity about a year and a half ago to re-architect our front end, to rewrite our front end, to get it on something modern. It was a terrific opportunity. I really enjoyed it. And I was on the team that got to spearhead that. So I'm one of the core contributors to this new repo. I'm one of the veteran developers in our front end. And now, after a year and a half of being in that situation, I find that there's still a ton of things that I just don't know. Things that other teams have gone and picked up this code base, and they figured out their own problems. They figured out their own solutions. And so we're no longer the experts. I'm no longer the expert. It, all this knowledge is spread out across our teams, across individuals, and we have this challenge of how do we, as individual contributors, we pick up a feature to work on. How do we write code that we're confident in? How do we write code that we know adheres to all our best practices, that it follows the patterns that we figured out for solving problems in the context of our application? So we have a couple tools for this. We have something called testing. And uh, Justin Scholes gave a great t talk on this yesterday. He talked about unit tests and integration tests. And we have both of those. So unit tests are fantastic. We know that for a given component or module, given some inputs, it produces the desired set of outputs. And we can make sure that all of our units of work are functionally correct. And we have integration tests. So when we integrate all these components, do they still work together? Do they have the desired output? Is our application functionally correct? But both of these types of tests are really for the user experience. They're for our users to make sure that when we change something, we don't have a regression. We don't introduce a bug. When they click a button, it still works. It still does something. What I'm really interested in, though, is what about us? What about us as developers? What about our developer experience? What are we doing for ourselves? What are we doing to protect our code base and its quality and its maintainability? How are we making sure that it's consistent? How are we making sure that when we solve a problem and we see that problem again, we solve it in a very similar way? So we have a couple tools at our disposal that can help with this. We can document everything. Whenever we see something, we figure out how to, how to call out to an API and how we should call, um, wire up our data to our view, whatever it might be. We can document that. We can create examples, and we can, we can tell people about it. And we, can, we have a bunch of ways we do that. We actually pair 95% of the time. So we're always learning and teaching each other. We're always sharing knowledge. We do rotations across teams where I'll go work on a team that works on something different. I'll learn about what they're doing. And we have all these ways of spreading knowledge. But at the end of the day, we still have to either read it, well, we have to write it, we have to read it, and we have to tell people about it, and we have to listen to it, and then we have to remember exactly how to apply it, exactly when it applies. And there's another tool we use, code reviews. So we, do, uh, we code review everything we do, so we, we pair on it, so there's already two developers writing something, but then we have yet a third developer pick it up and take a look and see if there's anything we missed. Uh, a nice thing about that is it goes both ways. So I might review some code, and I might see something that, yeah, um, we should probably change this. This could be written a little bit better. It could be structured a little differently. Or this API is deprecated. There's something new that we should be using instead. I might also look at it and see something that I don't recognize that I'm like, oh, that's cool. I didn't know we could do that. I didn't know that there was this new API that I could, I could use to, 
to query something in the DOM or whatever it might be. So code review is an awesome way to catch those things that we, that we don't all know. But what if we could have this automated? I found that there was a lot of things that kept coming up in code review that were repeating themselves. And we as developers, well, we want to automate everything that we see. We want to automate ourselves out of a job if we're doing our job correctly. And so if we, if we see something more than once, we want to automate that. And what better way than to write a test? So there's this type of test that I don't hear many people talking about. And that, that's why I'm here. It's convention testing. So we have these code conventions. We have these patterns. They may be stylistic. They may be how we use a library or a framework. They might be how we solve problems in the context of our application. Those are conventions. And if we can codif codify them into convention tests, then we can automate detecting these things. So we're consistent. So we have our best practices throughout our application. Now, you may know convention tests by a couple other names. Uh, they're most commonly known as linters. Uh, in JavaScript, we have JSLint, J, uh, JSHint, and ESLint. Uh, Python has um, PyLint. Uh, Ruby has something. .NET has uh, Rosalind analyzers. That's another term for this, uh, code analyzers. And a lot of uh, looking at uh, code and inspecting it falls into the category more broadly called syntac syntactic analysis. The problem with these tools, though, is that they often speak to language conventions. So for a given language, there's all these things that you can do with it. And we've, we've figured out by now, there's a lot of things in, say, JavaScript that are uh, possibly things that you can do that you really shouldn't. Things like, um, we have this thing called eval. So given a string of code, we just arbitrarily execute it. What could go wrong? I mean, maybe we got this text from the user. We trust them, right? So we've got... We've got these tools that, for given languages, for given platforms, they look for things that we know are bad across the industry, no matter where we go. And we can configure those tools, and we can have this in place. But what about our project conventions? What about how we're using those languages? What about how we're using those frameworks and libraries? What about in the context of our application? Because we're, we're all writing different applications. And we're all using these same tools in very different ways. If that wasn't the case, I could get up and go to another job that requires JavaScript and just get right to work without any help needed. It's not that simple. There's a lot of nuances about how our applications are built and the patterns and best practices that are specific to our applications. So what if we could test for our project conventions? What if we could write our own convention tests? What if we weren't limited to these shared tools that are specific to language and the platform in a broad sense, but apply those same tools in the microcosm that is our application code? So fortunately, there are some tools that allow us to do this. So those linters, those static analyzers, these uh, convention test frameworks of sorts, they all have common tests included. And fortunately, a great number of them, more and more, have a pluggable API for writing your own tests. So in the JavaScript world, and I'm, I'm, I'm a JavaScript developer. It's OK if you're not. I'm going to talk about our ecosystem, and I'm going to show some code in our language. But it all translates very well to Python, to .NET, to whatever you might be using. I've looked at what the tests look like in those languages. It's very similar. But I look for those tools that have the pluggable API so we can write our own tests first class. And ESLint, ESLint is a great example of that in JavaScript. So let's take a step back, because there's, a piece, there's an important piece we need before we understand how to write a convention test, how to do syntax analysis. We need to think about something that's very computer science-y. We need to think about the meaning of life. So we have this code here. We have a, an answer uh, variable that we're defining. And we're saying it's going to be uh, 6 times 7. Well, the question I'm asking is, how does this work? How do we turn this into something that the computer can understand? How do we break this down into bits, ones, and zeros? 
Well, the first step, it's called lexical analysis. This is where we tokenize the language. And if anyone is here at yesterday's uh, 4 o'clock for Matt Steele's talk on uh, uh, Get to the Chop Bar, uh, check it out. He goes into this in greater detail than I do, and it's very entertaining. But I will give you the key points right here that we need. So first we take a look at this language. What are the individual pieces that we need to break this down into? What are the tokens that stand apart from each other? So in this case, we've got the var keyword for a variable assignment. We've got this answer identifier, the equal sign, the operator to assign something. We've got that six, that number. And then we've got a multiplication operator, another number, and a semicolon to say we've terminated our statement. So that's the first step. We just create this list of tokens. The next step is called syntactic analysis, or syn oh, sorry, syntax analysis. So this is where we actually apply a different set of rules of language. We don't care now what the tokens are. We care what do they mean? What are the semantics of our language? So now we've given these tokens and what they are. How do we represent this? How do we break this into some data structure that has the meaning of we're defining a variable and we're multiplying two values and we're assigning that to the variable? We need some kind of data structure for this. Turns out we've been using something called a tree for quite some time now. And there's this concept of a syntax tree that I'd like to introduce. It's essentially a tree. Now, a syntax tree, I, I refer to them as syntax trees. They're technically abstract syntax trees. And uh, often you see them as AST for short. I have a hard time saying abstract, though. And I don't, I don't want to use an acronym throughout my talk if I'm explaining it. So I'm just going to call it a syntax tree. It's very easy to say. So let's consider an example. Let's take a look at some code and see how it breaks down into a tree. Actually, first, let's see what might be wrong with it. So given this code, we've got two things. We've got a function, add 10, that takes some value, adds 10 to it, and returns it. And then we've got some if statements. And if uh, one thing's true, and then if something else is true, we do something. So what about this could be improved? Well, we have this sum variable that we're not even using. It might have made sense at one time, but we're not using it at all. And in JavaScript, semicolons are optional, but we happen to be using them inconsistently. So maybe we want to fix that. The other thing is, we've got two if statements that are checking two different things and then doing something. We could probably combine that into a single if statement and just end the conditions. So it should really look something like this. So we've applied some conventions here. What is there in ESLint that can help us? Now in the first case, that function definition, there are a couple built-in rules that do help us. There is a no used, unused vars rule to make sure that if we have a variable and we don't use it, we find out about it. We want to clean that up. And there's a semi-rule that we can configure. We want to use semicolons or we don't. OK, we're good. That second case, as it turns out, there isn't a rule for. When you have an if statement with a directly nested if statement below it, and that does something, we've got this extra nesting. We've got an extra statement in there. We could clean this up and just make it uh, a single if statement. So I thought this would be a great opportunity to write our own convention test for this. So what does this look like? Let's, let's think about the if statement first. So given the if statement, um, I have on the, the left the, the tree, and on the right is the richer JSON representation of this tree. And there's a couple details I want to point out. So in JavaScript, we have uh, objects, and they're, they're very much like dictionaries. We have some key value, uh, some key that's a string, and then some value that corresponds to it. So here we have. Uh, a type for this node, and it's an if statement. And then we have some test, the, the conditional that we're going to evaluate. And if this is truthy, we're going to execute the consequent. If it's falsy, and if we have an else to go with our if, it'll execute the alternate. Let me point out two more things. So the test itself is a node as well. So in that case, we have uh, a node of a type identifier. It's some variable. And then its name is some condition. And the consequent is just a block statement. It's just some curly braces that don't have anything in it. 
So we're going to see something there soon, but this is a block statement, and the way it looks is it doesn't have a name, it has a body, and that's going to be an array, a collection of any number of statements that can be children of that. So let's consider the nested if statement. What does that look like? So now we've introduced an if statement that's a child of that block statement. And under the body, we can see that there's a value here. There's another node, and its type is if statement. So that looks familiar. We've seen that before. So how does ESLint work? How does it give us hooks into, it, into the tool to execute what we have for convention tests? So ESLint first builds a tree for us. It goes and parses over all your language. Uh, it uses a parser to do that. And then it takes that tree and walks the tree. It iterates over the nodes for us. Now, when it comes across a given node, it says, hey, I've got a node of a given type. What rules are out there? What tests are out there that are looking for this type of node? So this is our boilerplate for an ESLint rule. It's really a, a node module or a common JS module. And it exports a function. That function takes in something called context. Context is in the context of the node that we're currently on in the traversal. And it's going to give us some APIs that we can use to traverse the tree, to look up the tree, and to find out information that we're going to need. Now, that function in and of itself returns a dictionary. It returns an object. And the keys on that object are node types. So this is where, how we say, hey, when you find an if statement, let me know. And, when, and pass that node into this function. So this is the function that we're really going to be working on, that we're going to be writing. So when we get our node, we want to inspect it. We want to test some things on it. And then if we find something that we don't like, if we find some pattern that is in any pattern, that we're, if we find some code that we don't want in our, in our code base, we can report it. And we say, hey, context.report, I've got this node, and here's the problem with it. So let's think about how we can look over this tree and how, how can we reason about this? Now, given this tree, there's two if statements, right? There's the one higher up in the tree, and then there's the one that's nested. We could start from the top and look down, or we could start from the bottom and look up. Um, I think it'll be a little bit more straightforward if we start with the nested if statement and look up, because there's only so many ancestors. And if we start at the top, we then have to traverse down the tree for ourselves. So what do we need to get at? So that thing I mentioned before called context, it has a get ancestors function. And we can get our ancestors for our node. So we get that back as an array. And uh, in JavaScript, that looks very much sort of like a stack. Uh, and you can pop off it. So if we get our ancestors, and then we pop off the first value, we've got the immediate parent. Pop off another value, we've got the grandparent. Turns out those are the pieces that we're going to need. So let's consider the directly nested case. I've taken away the curly braces wrapping our if statement, and we should probably have those, but we want to be able to support this. And it's a little bit simpler to think about when we get started. So what are we concerned with? When we get in here into our rule, we're going to start with that if statement node that I've highlighted there. We're starting there. And so it corresponds to that node that's passed into the function. We want to check though its parent. We want to look at its parent type. It's directly nested, so its immediate parent is another if statement. So this check is really trivial. Is its parent's type an if statement? If it is, it's directly nested. Let's consider that block nested case. We've got curly braces again. We've reintroduced that block statement in between the two if statements. So this check is a little bit different. So if we've got a parent that's an if statement, or if we've got a parent that's a block statement, we need to check something else. If our parent's a block statement and our grandparent is an if statement, we've got a nested if statement. So this right here is actually essentially the test. This is looking for we've got an if statement within an if statement. There's a little bit more to it, though. We've got a couple cases that might get in our way that are actually valid. 
Let's consider the sibling's case. We've got our if statement. If that's true, we do something. And then we check for something else, and if that's true, we do another thing. So that's okay. We, we don't want to combine those two if statements. There's some meaning there to it being nested. So here's where we need to take a look at that body. So the body of that parent if statement, again, it has any number of things. Before, we just had that if statement. Now we've got another child there, another node sitting there. This check is just as simple as looking at the parent's body, looking at the length of that array. If it's one, we've only got one thing, and it's our if statement. If it's anything else, we've got siblings, and we don't want to throw up on that. There's one more case we need to look at. What about the else if case? So as it turns out, the way we have it, this will also match as a directly nested if statement, but this is semantically OK. This is fine. We want to have else ifs. So now the if statement that we're starting with, it's not the, under the consequent, it's under the alternate. So we could test one of two things. We could say, hey, are we, are we dealing with the alternate of our parent, or are we dealing with the consequent of our parent? So we add one more check. So again, if our parent is an if statement, and our node matches the consequent, well, we're dealing with it being that directly nested if. If it's the alternate, it's in the else. That's OK. So we just check to make sure that our node matches the consequent. Only then do we want to say that there's something wrong here. So it turns out that the check we have here to see if the consequent of the parent matches the node, it implicitly verifies that it's an if statement. And we can get rid of that extra check. So we're back down to four conditions that we're looking at. And that's essentially it. Here we've written a no nested if rule to make sure that if we've got two if statements, net one directly nested in the other, we can find that. And we'll know that we can clean that up, make it a single if statement, reduce some nesting. And while this is a trivial example, I've found that a lot of rules we've written are very similar to this, checking two or three or four conditions. So let me show you a demo of this tool in action. So I have a code base here. I set up a repo for this talk, which I'll give you the link to in a moment. And uh, in it, there's a code directory. And there's, there's two, sorry if that's hard to see, it's a little bit blurry even. But um, there's two directories in there. One is an ESLint plugin. So this is how, uh, in ESLint, rules are distributed. They're comma JS uh, node modules that are published on NPM. And you can also publish them on like a private NPM registry, which is what we do. But in any case, we've got our module there. And then you can have any number of rules that are part of this module. In this case, we just have one, the no extra if. So this is the rule we just worked on that I have up. And it's, it's exactly what we just wrote. There's a little bit of commenting here and so forth. Now, one thing I didn't show you were the tests for this. And if you like to do test-driven development, or if you at least like to just have tests, and I mean, this whole talk is about having tests, but if you like to test what you're doing and make sure that it works, I found this is a great way to write your rules. So ESLint comes with an ESLint tester utility. And the cool thing about this is you just set up an array of valid strings that might look like the pattern that you're after, but are actually valid. So you just create an array of, of these uh, code examples. And then for all the cases that you want to detect, you create another array for invalid. And this is a little bit richer. So each of these are an object, and you have our code, our little snippet that we want to fail on. And then we have our error messages. So we want to say, hey, uh, we've got an if statement, and here's what's wrong with it. So what this looks like when we run it is this. So we've, we've run all the tests, and it's saying, yeah, all those checks, both valid and invalid, worked. If I want to fail one of those, let's say I go into the rule, and I take, all, take off that check for the parent's body length. It fails. We actually have two cases that are looking for that. So this is a great way to write the rules. The testing utility is very handy and very convenient. Let's fix that. OK, so what is it like running it for our application? So also in this repo, I've set up um, a two MVC example. 
So this has got a, uh, a to-do MVC forked. Um, it uses React, which isn't too important, but it's got a problem in it that we want to detect using our rule. So let's run ESLint on this, see what we get. OK, so it found something. It's got one problem. There's something in to-do item JSX. An unexpected if is the only statement in an if block. They, that looks familiar. So let's jump over to our code. So here's to do item JSX. And actually, I'm using an editor here, and it's, it's telling me, hey, there's an issue. And if I go to that, it's telling me it's, there's a plugin set up here uh, that uses ESLint and runs all the rules. And if it finds something while I'm developing, it's going to let me know. So I should have already caught this, but uh, here it is. So let's fix this real quick. Let's unnest this if statement. All right, that should do it. Oh, thank you. Cool, that was another rule. <laughs> All right, we're good. That, that issue on the bottom went away. And if we run our test here, there's no output. We're good. So we run these tests as part of, um, a part of our testing suite. We run our unit tests, we run some integration tests, and we run our convention tests. So there's one more thing I want to show you. And there's, it's a tool called the uh, Esperma Parser Demo. So Esperma is one of those tools for building our syntax trees. And uh, ESLint actually uses a fork of it called Esprit. But this, this works perfectly for uh, explaining and, and trying things out. So given the code we actually looked at before, let me uh, dig in this. That's better. So given that code, we can see the tree on the right, the syntax um, tree uh, in a JSON representation. We can also see a little bit more of a collapsible view. So we can take a look at that. It also shows us our tokens. We talked about uh, the lexical analysis and tokenizing. That's what that looks like. That's what that produces. So I found this tool to be absolutely invaluable. If you're trying to figure out, I've got some code. I want to detect this pattern. Punch it in here. Look at the JSON output. See what it looks like. Get a feel for it. And this tool is perfect for that. OK, back to the slides. So all of that stuff is up on my GitHub account. Um, it's my name, scaling-best-practices. So uh, I'll, I'll tweet this after the talk. So what else? What else can we do? So we've, we've written a convention test. But what, what, what other convention tests might we write? Um, let me give you an example. So in our code base, uh, we have data requests. And we request data. We say, hey, give us a certain number of records. We don't want all of it, because there might be a lot of data. And what we found was we had some situations where we were requesting an unbounded amount of records. We had a, a page size, we call it. And when this is unbounded, we're getting a ton of data, potentially. And we have some users that really love our app. And they punch all their data into it, and there's a ton of it. And we found that they were actually timing out after 30 seconds because there's so much data coming down. They couldn't possibly retrieve it all. So we quickly found, yeah, we really shouldn't be having unbounded page sizes in our application. So we wrote a test for that. Um, there's other tests we might do that are a little bit more trivial. Maybe we're looking for a, enforcing a style guide. We're trying to have consistent style, consistent indentation. Um, maybe we want to name things camel case, maybe whatever it might be. Unfortunately, a lot of these tools have uh, style guides implemented and rule sets that you can import as dependencies and configure. Uh, but if you have to write your own, those rules are somewhat trivial, and you can, you can do that for yourself. So we just learned what convention tests are. They're tests, this syntax analysis, this, this linting. We can think of them as first-class citizens in the testing world and call them as such. We've talked about syntax trees. We've wrapped our head around what is this, this computer science-y data structure, and how does it work? And the nice thing is, you can do things besides just convention tests with that. You can do things like, like refactoring tools. You can do code transformations. There's really amazing things you can do with a syntax tree, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. And finally, we've actually written a convention test for ourselves. We've seen what this looks like, and there's not that much to it. So I want to encourage each and every one of you, 
go forth and write these tests. Start with implementing existing tools. Pick up ESLIN, pick up Pylint, pick up uh, Rubocop or, or Rosalind Analyzers in .NET, whatever it might be. Look to see what there is in your language, in your platform, and set it up for your project if you don't have it already. And next, consider what are your project's conventions? What are those things that you keep seeing? What are those things that keep repeating themselves in code reviews that you want to simplify? You want to create a feedback loop that, for your developers that's much tighter. So when you're writing your code in your editor, it's going to say, hey, yeah, this is the way you express something. It's old and deprecated. This API is going away in the next version. We don't want to use that anymore. Or, hey, yeah, you should really specify a page size that's reasonable and not fetch a ton of data and time out on the user. And write your own convention tests. Give this a try. Go home and pick up one of these tools and try writing your own tests. Come up with something, maybe something that's already implemented, and just try writing it for yourself and see what that looks like. I think you'll find very quickly it's not that bad at all, and it's, it's quite easy to do. I've also found it to be quite fun as well. When I'm working on an application, there's all kinds of things to worry about. When I'm working on a convention test, it's this tight, clean, clean, clean room of code where I'm just dealing with some, some very simple problem. It's kind, of, it's kind of refreshing to work on something so simple once in a while. And finally, it's really about improving your own developer experience. Think not only about your end user, but the code base that you're maintaining. If you can make that better, then it's going to be better for your end users. It's going to be better for your company. It's going to be more maintainable. But above all, it's going to be more enjoyable for you to work in. It's going to be that much more pleasurable. You're going to be that much more effective. And when the new guy starts next week, and, they're, and they pick up the code base, and they get in there, and you say, there's a bunch of things to learn. But when you start writing things, fortunately, we've got a whole suite of tests. So if you start doing things that you shouldn't, It'll let you know. And now you're not relying on documentation exclusively. Now there's fewer things that come up in code review. And the things that come up in code review can be the more advanced things that you really want to talk about. I think Donald Knuth said it very well when he said that programs must be written for people to read. And only incidentally for machines to execute. It's about us. It's about what we're working with. This has been a wonderful experience. Thank you all for being here. Thanks. So we do have time for questions. I saw someone right there. Hi. Um, I'm just curious. You mentioned that you know, both the job experience, it took you about six months to kind of grasp the concept. Um, I was wondering if you've done any analysis, you know, with all these conventional testing to see how long it would take a new engineer joining a team to kind of grasp the same concept. Yeah, we, we unfortunately haven't measured that. We've done two things to make it better. One, we chose simpler technologies, and we simplified how we're solving the problems. That's also important. I th think that that's perhaps the most important thing. But the second, the second thing, the, this line of defense of having convention tests to help steer people, um, it definitely simplifies when you pick up the code. Instead of seeing five different ways of doing something, it's much more closer to a single way of doing things when you're testing for those things. So I unfortunately don't have any metrics or anything but anecdotal evidence. Um, but we have made it significantly easier for our newer developers of all experiences to step in and become effective. And one quick follow-up. So you know, how do you go about coming up with a conventional um, that everyone agrees on? Um, you know, sometimes it's, we spend an hour just trying to come up, you know, like the curly break, brace, you know, where to put the curly braces, like simple yeah. things that we just spend a lot of time working on. So, you know, how, how, did you, how did you go about doing this? Did you just do it and push it out, say this is the way it's going to be, <laughs> deal with it, or...? I try to be a little bit more diplomatic than that. So that's a great question. And you can quickly get into holy wars about semicolons or no semicolons. How is your indentation, tabs or spaces? It can go crazy fast. Um, I like to start with, what are you already doing 90% of the time? Now, if you're already doing something 90% of the time and there's just a few edge cases, that's a lot easier to say, hey, let's, let's just fix those few places, the outliers, and make things consistent. From there... 
If there's a mix of things and you can't, don't really have a consensus, that's okay. But look for when it becomes a problem. Look for when you have something that comes up in the code review and it's like, yeah, that's a really bad pattern. And some of, them, some of it might be stylistic to make sure things are readable. Some of it will be a higher level. It might be how you're using your library or framework. Maybe you're using something that's deprecated. Maybe you're using your own API that you've written internally incorrectly. Uh, one cool thing that I forgot to mention is there, uh, libraries and frameworks these days are including rule sets. Um, I know this for ESLint, there's things for Angular and React and a couple different libraries that say, hey, here are the best practices for my library, and if you configure these rules, you can follow the best practices. So, uh, like I was saying, start with what you're already doing, and then second, uh, come up with a convention when it matters. Yeah, over. Oh, well. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I tend to stay away from front end, so... Uh, this assumption might be kind of incorrect, but it seems like on, on the front end side in terms of JavaScript um, and HTML, there's a lot of conventions that are not necessarily easy to follow, but a good web developer or front end developer should follow. Mm -hmm. um, I do a lot of back end uh, kind of distributed system stuff, so our tech stack is a lot larger, and our code, you can't find these patterns. <laughs> How can you apply something like this to code that can be a little more dynamic that does have uh, patterns inside of it, and also mm -hmm. code bases that can change. So like we're moving to, you know, from uh, MapReduce to Spark or something like that. Sure. So. Yeah, so that, that can definitely be trickier when there's a number of ways to express something, and they're all valid in different cases. And you can't quite cover them all. There's, it's really when you see something repeatable and you do have some identifiable way that you prefer doing, or maybe multiple ways. Because really these tests are about looking for something that is absolutely an anti-pattern and rooting that out. So you sometimes have that, you sometimes don't. Um, the second part of your question, I'm trying to remember what it was. Ah, code bases that can change a lot. Your technology stack changes. So I find it's absolutely advantageous to have these tests, especially when there's a suite of tests that are included with the library or a piece of the stack. That's making it that much more easy to get up to speed in something, get acclimated, know that you're following best practices. If you're changing things, well, you're changing things. You're going to have to rewrite all your unit tests, your functional tests, and you're going to maybe have to write your convention tests in a whole different suite. And you'll still have that. So I, I think it's more important, though, to smooth that transition as much as possible. And I think convention testing can help with that. So is there a negative return if you change things a lot? I'm sorry, what? Is there a negative return if you change things a lot? Like you could spend a lot of time on convention testing, but then mm -hmm. your tech stack changes once every 18 months, which doesn't sound like a good idea, but um, you know, something of that case. <laughs> yeah. So you might be able to port what your tests are. The logic that is dealing with the tree itself, if it's similar in whatever other language you might move to, or, move to, or maybe if the APIs that you're looking at are, have some corresponding API in the new framework or library, you might be able to do a little bit of a port, uh, a port of your roles. That might be possible. I think, in general, unless you're switching between like completely OO to functional, you're not going to see that being too much of a problem. One more question? Uh, yeah, do you have an example of... Uh, <laughs> a laptop fell. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> a case where you wanted to use or wanted to write a uh, test like this, but it didn't quite work out or you weren't able to write it. Ah. I haven't run into that yet. I did, um, I want to say the most complicated rule I've written or I've seen written was about 90 lines and it had a number of cases and it looked up the scope to see if you might have defined, it was actually the paid size uh, unbounded rule and you could define a configuration for your network request anywhere in the scope and we were able to look up the tree pretty efficiently and look for that getting defined at different levels. And that's the most complicated I've seen. I haven't personally run into anything that was just too hard to do, but that will happen. Just like when you're unit testing something or integration testing something, hopefully you don't run into it. That's usually a code smell if it's hard to test. Uh, but if you do run into something that is really challenging, it might not be worth going down. Well, thank you, everyone. I would love to hear more of your questions afterwards. I'll be in the hallway. And if you have anything you'd like to say or any questions about what I just talked about, I'd love to hear from you. Thanks.